The Bell, from the tales of Hans Christian Andersen. At the close of day, in the narrow streets of the city, as the sun went down and the clouds shone like gold up between the chimneys, one person after another would often hear a strange sound, like the ring of a church bell. But it was only heard for a moment, as there was such a rumbling of carts and such a lot of shouting that always disturbs the listener. There's the evening bell, people said. It's for sunset. Those who went outside the city where the houses stood wider apart with gardens and paddocks of their own had a far finer view of the evening sky and could hear the bell ring much louder. It was as though the sound came from a church in the very depths of the silent, fragrant wood. Then people looked in that direction and became quite solemn. A long time now passed, and one would say to another, I wonder if there's a church out there in the wood. There's a strange beauty in the sound of that bell. Oughtn't we to make our way out there and go into it all the more carefully? And the rich ones here drove and the poor ones walked, but they all found the road to be curiously long. And when they came to a big clump of wood willows that were growing on the fringe of the wood, they sat down there and looked up into the long branches and fancied that they were well out in the wilds. A pastry cook from the city came out to put up his tent, and then another pastry cook turned up and hung a bell immediately above his tent, a bell that was tarred over to resist rain, but it had no clapper. Then when the time came for people to go home again, they said how romantic it had been, and that means a good deal, quite apart from their having had tea. Three of them declared that they had made their way into the wood, right to the very end of it, and all the time they could hear the mysterious bell, though it seemed to them just as if the sound came from the city. One man wrote a whole poem about it, and said that the bell sounded like a mother's voice to her dear good child. No music was sweeter than the sound of the bell. The ruler of the country was also told about it, and he promised that whoever could really find out where the sound came from should have the post of universal bell ringer, even if it turned out not to be a bell. Numbers of people now went to the wood in the hope of getting such a good appointment, but there was only one who came home with any kind of explanation. None of them had been far enough into the wood, nor had this man either, but all the same he made out that the bell sound came from a very big owl in a hollow tree. It was a kind of owl of wisdom that kept knocking its head against the tree, but whether the sound came from the owl's head or from the hollow trunk, he couldn't yet say with any certainty. So he was appointed universal bell ringer, and every year he wrote a little essay on the owl, but no one was any wiser than before. And now it happened to be Confirmation Sunday. The parson had spoken with a fine sincerity. The confirmation candidates had been deeply moved. For them, it was a day of great moment. From being children, they suddenly became grown up. The soul of a child had now, as it were, to pass over into a wiser person. It was beautifully sunny. The boys and girls who had just been confirmed went out of the city, and from the wood came the sound, strangely deep, of the big unknown bell. At once they all felt a desire to go there, all but three of them. Of these, one had to go home to try on her ball dress, for it was this dress and this ball that were the real reason she had been confirmed this time, otherwise she wouldn't have come. The second was a poor boy who had borrowed his confirmation suit and his shoes from the landlord's son, and he had to take them back by a certain time. The third said that he never went to places he didn't know unless his parents went with him, and that, having always done as he was told, he wanted to go on doing so, even after being confirmed. And that's not a thing to jeer at, but that's just what they all did. Well, and so three of them didn't go, but the others trotted off. The sun shone, the birds sang, and the young people sang too, holding each other's hands. For you see, they were all still at school, and in the sight of heaven were simply boys and girls who had just been confirmed. But after a while, two of the smallest got tired, and so they both went home again. 
two little girls sat down and made wreaths. They gave up too. And when the others got as far as the willow trees where the pastry cook had his tent, they said, Well, here we are. There isn't really any bell. It's only a sort of idea that people get into their heads. At that moment, from the depths of the wood came the sound of the bell, so pure and so solemn that four of the five made up their minds, after all, to walk a little further into the wood. This grew so thick and so leafy that it was tremendously hard work to make headway. Wood rough and anemones were almost too tall, flowering convolvulus and trailing brambles hung in long festoons from tree to tree, where the nightingale sang and the sunbeams played. Yes, it was all very beautiful, but it was no place for young girls to walk. Their dresses would have got torn to shreds. There were large boulders overgrown with moss of various colors, and fresh spring water came trickling out with strange tones that seemed to say, Cluck, cluck. I wonder if that could be the bell, said one of the boys, lying down to listen. This is worth going into carefully. So he stayed behind and let the others go on. They came to a hut built out of bark and branches with a large crab-apple tree leaning over it as though to empty out the whole of its cornucopia on the rose-grown roof. The long branches followed the line of the gable, and from this hung a little bell. Could that be the one they had kept on hearing? Yes, they all agreed about that, except one who said that this bell was too small and delicate to be heard as far away as they'd heard it and that these tones were very different from those that could move the human heart so deeply. The one who spoke was a prince, which made the others say, a fellow like that always thinks he knows better than other people. So they let him go on alone, and as he went, his heart was more and more filled with the loneliness of the wood. Yet he could still hear the little bell which the others were so pleased with, and now and then, when the wind was coming from the direction of the pastry cooks, he could also hear how they were singing over their tea. But the deep notes of the bell sounded louder still, and now it was just as if an organ were playing an accompaniment. The sound came from the left, from the same side as the heart. Suddenly there was rustling in the bushes, and there before the prince was a little boy in wooden clogs, and a jacket so short that you couldn't help seeing what long wrists he had. They both recognized each other, the boy was the one who couldn't join the rest after confirmation because he had had to go and take back his suit and his shoes to the landlord's son. He had done that, and now in his wooden clogs and old clothes he had gone off alone. So loud and deep was the sound of the bell that he felt he really must come out to the wood. Well then, we may as well go along together, said the prince. But the poor boy in the clogs was very shy and pulled at his short sleeves saying that he was afraid he wouldn't be able to keep up with the other. Besides, he thought that the bell ought to be looked for on the right, for that was the direction for finding all that was great and glorious. Well, in that case, we shan't see anything of each other, said the prince, nodding to the poor boy, who plunged into the darkest, densest part of the woods, where the thorns tore his humble clothes to shreds, and also his face, hands, and feet until they were bleeding. The prince likewise got some nasty scratches, but at least he had sunshine to brighten his path, and he's the one we'll go along with now, for he was a bold lad. I will and must find the bell, he said, even if I have to go to the ends of the earth. Horrible-looking monkeys sat up in the trees, baring their teeth as they grinned. Shall we pelt him? they chattered. Shall we pelt him? He's the son of a king. But he steadily made his way deeper and deeper into the wood, where the most wonderful flowers were growing. There were star lilies with blood-red filaments, pale blue tulips that glittered in the wind, and apple trees on which the apples looked exactly like great shining soap bubbles. Just imagine how those trees must have sparkled in the sunlight, bordering the lovely green meadows where stag and doe were frisking on the grass, stood magnificent oaks and beeches, and whenever one of the trees had a split in its bark, grass and long creepers were growing out of it. 
There were also long stretches of woodland with peaceful lakes on which swans were swimming and flapping their wings. The prince often stood still and listened, thinking that it might be from one of these deep lakes that the sound of the bell came up to him. But then he noticed that, sure enough, it wasn't there but still further in the wood that the sound of the bell came from. It was now sunset. The sky shone red as fire, and a deep hush came over the woodland. The boy went down on his knees and sang his evening hymn, and said to himself, I shall never find what I'm looking for. Now the sun is setting and night, dark night, is coming on. Yet perhaps I may have one more glance at the round red sun before it sinks below the horizon. I'll climb up those rocks towering there as high as the tallest trees. And catching hold of tendrils and roots, he clambered up the wet rocks past writhing water snakes and toads that almost seemed to bark at him. Yet he reached the top before the sun, seen from that height, had completely vanished. Oh, what magnificence! The sea, the glorious ocean, tumbling its long waves on the shore, lay stretched out before him, and the sun stood like a great shining altar in the distance, where sea and sky met, and everything was fused in glowing colors. The woodland sang, and the ocean sang, and his heart sang too. Nature was a great holy cathedral, in which trees and hovering clouds were its columns, flowers and grass its altar cloth of woven velvet, and the vault of heaven its mighty dome. Now the crimson colors faded as the sun went down, but millions of stars were kindled, millions of diamond lamps were lit, and the young prince spread out his arms towards the sky, towards the ocean and wood, and suddenly from the path on the right, in his short sleeves and wooden clogs, came the poor boy who had that day been confirmed. He had got there just as quickly by his own route. They ran to meet each other, taking each other by the hand there in the great cathedral of nature and poetry. And above them sounded the sacred invisible bell, while blessed spirits hovered about it in joyful praise to God. The End